All right, uh, why don't we get started. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Eugene Goltz. I'm a professor at the LBJ School and the uh, co-organizer of the Strauss Center's International Security Speaker Series. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, third installment of the spring semester. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't uh, advertise or flog the future ones, so I want to um, remind everyone on the Strauss Center website there's a complete list of events, but there are two more in this series scheduled, um, one on April 2nd with Tim Naftali talking about foreign policy of George H.W. Bush, so Bush 41, and then on uh, April 10th with uh, uh, Philip Zelico and uh, uh, he was the executive director of the 9-11 Commission and uh, um, had a number of senior positions in the Bush White House, and I actually can't remember the title of his talk. But it's on the Strauss Center website, so I hope you will join us uh, for the other ones. Um, but uh, today, I'm very pleased that we have Mike Moore, uh, who's currently a senior fellow at the Independent Institute to talk with us about um, the dangers of weaponizing space, or I think it actually says on the poster, outer space. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sure he'll be interested. He's probably not in favor of weaponizing any kind of you know, outer, inner space, whatever that would be either, but uh, um, space. And uh, um, Mike uh, comes to us uh, from the, he's, he's, been working, he's been working as a fellow at the Independent Institute writing these books. His background prior to that, though, uh, he was steeped deeply in these questions of um, uh, new weapons technologies, the uh, arms control, the threats that might be generated, um, or responses between technologies, uh, responses to threats with technologies, for many years as the editor of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, um, which many of you may know is uh, actually a, a wonderful publication that uh, uh, crosses the boundary. It matches the Strauss Center's uh, uh, mission in many ways. It crosses the boundary between um, science and scientific expertise and really a high level of professional discussion with reaching the general public and talking about the implications of science for society, and particularly they're famous for um, the Doomsday Clock, which uh, appeared on the cover of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist for a long time that uh, uh, Mike may talk about in some, you know, offhanded way, but it, the, the hour hand on the doomsday clock moved at different times uh, to suggest how dangerous they kind of thought the world was, how close we were to doomsday. And now it's um, gone digital. And has it gone digital? Yeah, that, I've, I've still got the, the analog it. sign, but, uh, well, see, behind technology, I can't keep up. But, um, but wonderful experience for exactly the kind of things the Strauss Center is interested in doing, and in fact, um, uh, you know, kind of connecting uh, uh, practical discussions of uh, policy and science and um, uh, academic research and scholarship to the real concerns of um, uh, the community outside the university. And um, uh, it's sort of fitting that Mike's in that business, too, before he was at the Bulletin of Economic, of economic of Atomic Scientists having a rough time. Um, uh, he, he, his background was in uh, journalism, and uh, in fact, he edited a, a magazine for the Society of Professional Journalists, the kind of leading uh, uh, journal or the group uh, from the organization of journalists called Quill. And some of you may be familiar with Quill. Um, it gives him a wonderful, diverse background, actually. You've got the writing and humanities, and then the science and war. And then it brings us to today, the dangers of weaponizing outer space. So uh, take it away, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Should I move this over too? Yeah. I wonder. I like to keep things pretty informal. I'm going to uh, run through a few things very quickly so we can get to the Q&A. I like the Q&A much better than anything else. But as I go through, if somebody doesn't quite understand what I'm saying, you know, break in. Ask me, what do I mean by that? Uh, I don't want to get into any long debates during my presentation, such as it, as it is, but uh, I do want to be clear about things. So don't, don't hesitate to break in. But again, the big part, for me at least, is the Q&A.
I've spoken on several university campuses recently, and uh, Q&A is always the best. My main message is we're heading into a new arms race. It would be a space-related arms race. I think if we persist in policies we've been following now for several years, we're almost certainly going to be in that arms race, and I think that's too bad. Uh, I think the opportunity cost of such an arms race will be great, as well as the direct financial cost. But I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, how, do we, how do we get into this? Uh, I'm going to follow four strands of argument. Uh, first is, uh, is, has to do with President Eisenhower, and the second has to do with a concept of precision war. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit about the concept of space control, or space dominance, as it's often referred to. And then I'm going to get to American exceptionalism, which I think is an important driver here. We'll start with Eisenhower. I'm a longtime Democrat. My first vote was for Jack Kennedy. I thought Eisenhower wasn't much of a president. But in recent years, I've come to regard him pretty highly. I won't get into that in any detail, except to say, excuse me. Oh. <laughs> good, good for you. <laughs> well, but I, anyway. Uh, we agree. <laughs> uh, Eisenhower and Dulles talked about massive retaliation and so on and so forth. But in fact, Eisenhower sought to avoid war as in any way possible, whether brush fire wars or, or full-fledged Soviet-American confrontation. He worked harder on avoiding war than any than uh, we Democrats understood at the time. When it came to space, he recognized pretty early that space could be a scene of conflict. <clears throat> and as early as 1955, he uh, established an embryonic space for peaceful purposes policy. 1955, that's uh, two years before Sputnik. Now, after Sputnik, he came under extreme pressure for dropping the ball. He was attacked by editorial page editorialists, by opinion makers of all kinds, by, by Time magazine, which had otherwise supported him. He was attacked by, by even by his own military men. Uh, General John Gavin thought he was making a terrible mistake by, by not going full bore toward weaponizing space, or at least taking control of space in some means. His own uh, chief of the Air Force, Thomas Dresser White, chief of staff of the Air Force, you're not in your head, uh, ar argued as early as February 1958 that the goal of all Americans, the goal of all Americans, should be control of space. But Eisenhower stood his ground. He thought it would be madness to weaponize space or try to control space. Uh, what he wanted to do and what he, what he attempted to do through back channel uh, negotiations and talks and so on was to get the Soviets to agree to uh, declare space as off limits for weapons. That idea culminated in the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. The Outer Space Treaty of 1967 declared that space should be used only for peaceful purposes. Uh, it said that the moon would be off limits for any military purpose. It said that orbital space would be off limits for nuclear weapons or any other weapon of mass destruction. It, nobody back then envisioned any other kind of weapon in space but it would be off limits to nuclear weapons and, and weapons of mass, destru mass dis destruction. Okay, now we'll go to strand two, precision war. I had a quick question. Uh, didn't intercontinental ballistic missiles travel through that area of space when launched? Uh, the question is, didn't ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, travel through space? And, and they did, indeed. And they were, uh, by common consent between the two countries, they were declared not to be space weapons. They were land-based missiles that happened to traverse space. Uh, both countries uh, believe they needed ICBMs. Uh, 
The Soviet Union was encircled by uh, Strategic Air Command air bases, and they started their ICBM program pretty early, earlier than we did. And of course, uh, many of you remember the bomber gap and then the missile gap rhetoric. Uh, we, we were a little bit behind in developing ICBMs, but we figured we had to do that. Uh, so these were not classified as space weapons. Now, precision war. Uh, precision war has a very old uh, history. As early as World War I, airmen, especially in Britain, Italy, and the United States, were talking about the next war. And they looked at the terrible slaughter in the trenches, the eight or nine million men who died in the mud, and the barbed wire, and so on and so forth. And they began to develop a doctrine, and when I say began, it was all pretty uh, unfocused at first, but they developed a, a doctrine that said war was immoral, it's a slaughter, but maybe we can do war better the next time around. Now they presented humane reasons for conducting something they called precision bombing. Uh, Basically, it would mean that you would develop battle planes, which are bombers, long-range bombers that could attack targets in the rear, and you would attack these targets with a very, pre very precise weapons that would actually hit the targets. Uh, you would take out ball bearing factories and, and, and oil refineries and that kind of thing. Well, in the uh, 1930s, the British and the Americans developed very sophisticated doctrines of strategic precision bombing, daylight precision strategic bombing. The idea being if you have to fight a war, let's get it over with quickly and let's don't kill a lot of civilians. When war came, you know, the Brits were the first to engage in long-range strategic bombing, daylight bombing, and it didn't turn out the way they fears thought it would. Uh, they usually couldn't find the city, and they suffered frightful losses from uh, flak and, and uh, German fighters. So they switched to area bombing at night. They called it precision bombing, but they were really bombing cities at that point, and they had a name for it, dehousing civilians, and the idea was you, could, you would bomb cities with incendiaries, explosives and incendiaries and set the cities on fire or portions of the cities and uh, that would uh, slow the war effort. The Americans thought the Brits just are not doing it right and when we got into it in uh, late 1943 we continued, we engaged in daylight st strategic bombing and we did it fairly well. We were able to come on average within, say, five miles of the target. So that meant if you wanted to take out a specific target, you had to drop a lot of bombs, and, and most of those bombs are going to miss. Uh, but at least we tried. Now, when we uh, began bombing Japan, we at first tried to do strategic precision bombing, and it didn't work. The B-29 uh, was a new plane, and it didn't work quite as we thought it would. The jet streams were, the jet stream was much faster over there and we couldn't, we couldn't hit the target. So we uh, began to do area bombing, the idea being to burn down the cities, get the little factories by burning down the cities. Nobody really knows how many people we killed in our bombing campaign uh, in Japan, but Reliable estimates are usually around 900,000 civilians. Now, McNamara, who was part of General LeMay's staff, LeMay organized the firebombing campaign, believes 900,000 is a credible figure. He said that LeMay said at one point, uh, if we lose the war, we'll all be tried as war criminals. At any rate, we get to Vietnam. We'll forget about the Korean War, which was World War II all over again, and it's bombing. I have talked to a lot of military people who now are fairly high up in the chain of command, who were second lieutenants in that war, first and second lieutenants, and they were traumatized by Vietnam in many ways. 
by the futility of the war, the ultimate futility of it, and by the deaths of American soldiers. But, and this came as a surprise to me, I suppose, they were most traumatized by the number of civilians, Vietnamese civilians who were killed in that war. And uh, late in the war, we began working very ser seriously on new kinds of weapons, precision-guided weapons, which would enable us to fight future wars in a more humane manner. Now, humane and war really don't seem to go together. It seems like an oxymoron. But it's my opinion that if you must fight a war, you should do it in the quickest, most efficient way possible, and the most humane way possible. You should target military targets and hit them, and try to spare civilians as much as you can. So that's number, that's strand number two. Strand number three has to do with how we do precision war today. I think probably you're all aware that we rely heavily on space assets to conduct precision war. Uh, observation satellites of various kinds, communication satellites, and especially GPS satellites, global positioning satellites. And it is amazing what we're able to do. We, uh, and, and I, I, I do not exaggerate here, and I've talked to a lot of, again, military people, on an off-the-record basis, but we can truly put a GPS-guided bomb into this room, maybe 98% of the time or 99% of the time, the so-called cir circular error probable of these weapons is really around 9 or 10 feet. Uh, so if you properly identify, identify a target, get the proper coordinates, you can hit that target almost every time. The first time uh, you know, that GPS-guided bombs were, were used was in 1999 with a NATO campaign, air campaign, over Kosovo and Serbia. We dr used 23,000 bombs and missiles in that air campaign. Most of them were not GPS. They were TV guided or laser guided or whatever. But 23,000, it sounds like you would have a lot of casualties, civilian casualties. Human Rights Watch went in after the war ended, expect and to do an underground survey of, of what happened to civilians. And they expected to find a lot of civilian casualties and deaths. And they weren't able to do that. And they documented and they carefully documented between 489 and 528 civilian deaths during the NATO air campaign. Now, some people would argue that the NATO air campaign was not justified. I'm not one of them, but some people do. But whatever you feel about the NATO air campaign, you have to admit that the U.S. Air Force, which really conducted the campaign, did their damnedest to uh, spare civilians, and they succeeded. Many of the deaths that were caused were caused <coughs> by a combination of events that were almost beyond control. For instance, in one case, a, uh, uh, we were taking out a bridge, and after the missiles were released, a, a train started to cross that bridge. At any rate, precision war is not a bad thing in itself. I'm not one of these guys who, who say that you can never go to war. I think there are times when you need to go to war. I think Iraq is not one of those occasions. <laughs> but there are times when you need to go to war. And if you do, and let's do it as a, humanely as, as we possibly can. Now the argument is, and here I get to men and women I call space warriors, the argument is, is that modern industrial society as well as uh, our new way of precision war depends on space assets, and we must protect them. I agree with that. I don't have any problem with that. We must protect these assets in space, whether they're commercial or scientific or military in nature. 
we must do it. And the question is how to do it. Space warriors and uh, argue that the best way to do it is to develop the ability to control space in a time of conflict. And they believe that if we, and then the military now has, has for the past decade or so, been using a term called full spectrum dominance in conflict. If we can exercise full spectrum dominance in conflict, then we can protect our national security, we can protect our space assets, and so on and so forth. When um, American space warriors began talking about full spectrum dominance in space and space control and, and so on, I wonder exactly what it is they're getting at. And actually, a few, at least, you know, actually many high level Air Force guys wonder what they're getting at, too. There are roughly 850 satellites in space right now in different orbits. The United States has more than half of those satellites, and 40 odd nations have the rest. In other words, we have the most satellites in space, which means that we might have the most to lose in a time of conflict. I've talked to, I, I can't name anybody, but I've talked to people who, who uh, have worked in very high jobs in the Pentagon, <coughs> who think it's kind of madness to talk about space control because, they argue, uh, that's simply going to trigger an arms race. They believe, at the very least, we should tone down our rhetoric. Uh, we have, for some years now, U.S. Space Command, which has now been folded into Strategic Command, and Air Force Space Command, and other segments of the Air Force have been, have been uh, putting documents on the web as if we want everybody to know what, what we're up to about space dominance. And I uh, and and again, it, it just seems kind of crazy. I, I I wonder I wonder what what are these guys thinking? Uh, if, for instance, we one of the documents I refer to says we should be able to exercise dominance of space by 2020. It's called Vision 2020. You can find it on the web. Uh, we should be able to dominate space militarily by 2020. Now, what if the Chinese or Russians <laughs> or Indonesians or Indians had issued a document saying we can dominate space, or we intend to dominate space militarily by 2020? We'd be going nuts over here. The president would be on TV saying this shall not stand. So what are they thinking? Well, one thing they're thinking about is China. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, a lot of people have been looking for the next great peer competitor. They use that term a lot, peer competitor. The next great strategic threat. And North Korea doesn't really do it. I mean, nobody, I think, really worries too much about North Korea. Or Iran, for that matter. Though Iran has the capability to do a lot of mischief. But it's not an existential threat like the Soviet Union. The only candidate is China. And it's been built up now in various kinds of war games as the uh, Near East peer competitor, or, or whatever the term of art is. Uh, and how are we going to win a conflict with this peer competitor? I just, uh, I'm kind of stunned by that. The Soviet Union was a real existential threat. The Soviet Union believed its mission was to organize a global economic system and a global political system that would be different from the Western system. And I, I don't discount for a, for a moment the action-reaction dynamic and, and our own culpability and, and, and in the Cold War. But the fact is the Soviets were determined to, to bury America, metaphorically speaking, 
with a new economic and political system. We were determined that this was not going to happen. If anything, we were going to bury them with our ideas about democracy. I don't want to get into the Cold War here, but, but obviously the two systems were antagonistic. When you look at China, you don't see that. By the early 70s, the, you know, the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party knew the country was pretty nearly bankrupt by any rational standard. And they began developing capitalism with Chinese characteristics. It was obvious, I think, from certainly the mid or late 70s, and it's certainly obvious today, that the Chinese have decided to uh, join the West in many ways. They need jobs for their own people. Tens of millions of people are unemployed in China, living almost at a starvation level. There are little rebellions in, in some of the outlying cities and towns, uh, fairly common. We don't hear about them, but, but it's happening. The Chinese need to join the Western system so they can Walmart America, and maybe Walmart England and Germany and everybody else. We need China, apparently, to produce cheap goods. Our consumers like cheap goods. Go into any Walmart or Kmart or almost anywhere, and uh, you'll find that virtually everything is made in China. So we, we're, we're kind of in bed uh, in that respect. We need those cheap goods. They need those manufacturing jobs. We're in bed together in another respect, too. Uh, we're able to keep our interest rates fairly low in this country because the Chinese, and the Japanese, and the Saudis buy so many treasuries that uh, Americans no longer want. Uh, maybe somebody in this room could put a precise figure on it, but I, I think the Chinese are buying about $200 billion of treasuries a year. And as long as the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Saudis buy these treasuries, we can keep our interest rates low and, and, and we're all happy. <laughs> now, it seems to me to be pretty odd behavior for our next peer competitor, our next great threat, to be in bed with us economically and financially. It doesn't make sense to me. Why do we think the Chinese are going to pick a fight with us, start an arms race. China has huge problems. And they're just barely able to feed their people. Uh, although the country is much larger than the United States, it has only about 18 or 20 percent of the arable land of the United States. Uh, they, they, need, they need us, they need to trade with the West. So why would they want to end that by starting an arms race, much less an actual conflict? They buy our treasuries. That helps us finance our own military machine. That's odd behavior, too. It doesn't make sense to me to think that China is the next great threat. It makes sense to me to think of China as a tough economic partner, and we're going to have trouble over the years as they develop their economy. But still, it's going to be economic in character and not, not military. So why... Uh, why do, we, why do we see it that way? I think uh, the spirit of American exceptionalism has a lot to do with how we do foreign policy. American exceptionalism goes way back, uh, long before there was the United States. Uh, the Europeans who came over here in the, in the uh, 16th century, many of them at least, believed that they were starting the world anew. They were, they were building a new society, free of the corruption of the old world. Many of them, not all, believe that there was a providential hand in all this, that God had decreed that America would be the new world in every possible way. Uh, those who didn't believe so much in a providential hand uh, and like John Locke, for instance, believe that the Americans were creating 
something that because of its civic virtue would be better than anything else ever in the history of the world. American exceptionalism has a long, long history. In its early days, America believed, or Americans tended to believe, that we were building something new and we would be a model to the world. Uh, the world would see what we were doing and maybe try to emulate us, but at any rate, we'd be kind of a, a city on a hill. But along came the Spanish-American War. Uh, things changed radically with the Spanish-American War. We got into it for fairly noble reasons, I suppose, because the Spanish were pretty rotten in their treatment of the Cubans and others. But after we won that quick little war, we had to decide what to do with the territory that we acquired. And there was a great debate in this country between people who, uh, who believed that America would be going too far, it would, be, it would violate its own, uh, its own founding values by uh, making the Philippines a colony, for instance. But on the other side, you had people who believed that it was God's, it was our mission, our God-given mission, to do just that, to try to spread democracy to the Filipinos and, and others. It's a very interesting chapter in American history. It kind of culminated with Woodrow Wilson, who is not my favorite president. When you look at Wilson pretty carefully, uh, he seems to say that we want all the people of the, of the world to, to be democratic and free and all that, as long as they accepted the American model. And that disturbs me. The American model is fine, I love it. But I don't think you can say that all the world has to accept the American model. Well, the spirit of American exceptionalism really died down after World War I to a great degree. I think uh, Americans, America's leaders decided the world was just too complicated. Uh, we, we couldn't spread our ideas everywhere and so on and so forth. We became highly isolationist in the interwar years. And even in uh, World War II, under Franklin Roosevelt, we believed in, 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 in more of a, a coalition idea. Uh, the United Nations became uh, the slogan in 1943. The United Nations fight for freedom, that kind of thing. And after the war, uh, the Cold War was too, too complicated too, and, and the, uh, and the uh, risk of a direct confrontation with the Soviet Union was too great to permit much of this kind of idealistic version of, of American exceptionalism where we're going, to, we're going to make the world safe for democracy no matter what. After the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a great resurgence in the exceptionalist idea, triumphalist, neoconservatives especially, uh, took it on in a big time way in the 1990s. Uh, the idea being that we had won the Cold War, in quotation marks, and now was the time to spread American style democracy everywhere. I oversimplify here, but, but that's, that's the trouble with these kinds of talks. We'll spread democracy everywhere. Uh, the Clinton administration didn't go along as much as with the neocon ideas as as the neocons did, but uh, even the Clinton administration bought into a lot of that rhetoric. And this spilled over into space. One of my best friends is a is a uh, a leading theoretician of the space warrior movement, and he's a neocon, and and we talk about that all the time. He believes that it's America's mission to control space for the good of humankind. He believes that we are the only country that can do it right because we are benign and we're democratic and we can, we can control space, we can be kind of, we can be a space cop, so to speak. And all humankind will benefit from that. Well, I, I do have trouble with that because again, as I said earlier, uh, 
What if the Chinese or Russians or anybody else said, well, we're going to control space for your own good? I think, uh, I think we would not accept that. We have to remember that uh, leaders of other countries, leaders of any country, try to divine the intentions of, of, of their great power rivals. But uh, more to the point, they try to understand their capabilities. Intentions can change. We can say that our space capabilities are, would not be used except in a time of conflict. But who's to say that our intentions would not change 10 years down the road or 15 years down the road? Uh, leaders have always got to look at capabilities. And right now, when uh, the leaders of other nations look at our capabilities, they're pretty staggering. We have demonstrated extreme military prowess in precision war. And we also have an anti-satellite program, or actually several anti-satellite programs. We don't often call them that, or we actually we don't talk, call them that. We are able to hit satellites in low Earth orbit pretty easily, I think, with kinetic kill weapons, as the Chinese did a year ago, January. We first demonstrated that capability, capability in 1985. We are still working on, on ground-based lasers that can do something in the satellites. I, I don't think there's much to that program because I think it's very difficult to use a ground-based laser to do anything damaging to a satellite, but we made our first test of that in 1997 and we're still working in that direction. We are, we are not working, so far as I know, on, on space-based weapons anymore in any serious way. We've given up pretty much the idea of lasers in space. They're uh, terribly expensive and, and uh, they probably wouldn't work and, and uh, they probably couldn't do anything that we can't do with other kinds of conventional weapons. Uh, for a time we were talking about little unmanned space bombers called common aero vehicles. Uh, they would go into space and then glide down and maneuver to hit a target. But that seems to be pretty fantastical, too. We were talking about rods from God, which would be tungsten rods in space that could be clawed down on a target and hit them at such speeds that they would pulverize the target. But that seems to be pretty fantastic, too. But what we are working on are several uh, small sat programs, small satellites, nanosats, microsats, they go under different names. Uh, this is an interesting program. We, even though we can hit satellites in low Earth orbit with kinetic kill vehicles, we don't want to because it creates too much debris in orbit and the debris becomes a threat to everything. So we don't really want to use that kind of capability. What we do see is the possibility of using these small satellites that can find and rendezvous with satellites in low Earth orbit or in medium orbits or even in high Earth orbit. We have demonstrated that capability. Now we don't call that a uh, we don't call these various demonstration programs weapons programs. Uh, we say that we're working on these. Uh, robotic satellites so that we can, we can uh, service our own satellites at some point. And there's uh, some common sense to that. Uh, our most sophisticated spy satellites are multi-billion dollar birds. And if, if we could service them and extend their lives in space, uh, that would be a fine thing according to, to some people. But as space warriors are the first to admit, and as other countries know, if you can find and rendezvous with a satellite in space, you've solved the basic problem of having an anti-satellite weapon uh, that would not create debris. If you can rendezvous with a, with a satellite, you could knock it into a useless orbit perhaps, or you could drag a mylar net across it and do the same thing to it, or you could 
set off a little electromagnetic pulse and fry its innards, or, or some people have even suggested you could spray a paint-like substance over its sensors. You could do almost anything to it to disable it, damage it, maybe even destroy it. Now, other countries are working on small satellites too, for mainly for scientific purposes, but we are way, way, way ahead. And this is a great concern. It's a great concern to China and Russia and other countries too. Now, what can be done? Are we going to trigger an arms race in space? The nations of the world have been voting in the UN General Assembly since 1981 to ask the Conference on Disarmament to get to work and try to negotiate a treaty of some kind that would prevent an arms race in space. Every country, virtually every country in the world has voted in favor of that resolution. Year after year it keeps popping up like clockwork. And every year, until recently, the United States, the United States simply abstained from, from voting. But in 2005, and it began to vote no. But whether we abstained or voted no, the effect has been the same. In the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, we have used our veto power to ensure that we will not talk about a space treaty in any serious way. We say, first of all, we have said in the past, there's no point in talking about a new space treaty because there is no arms race in space. That's been a line we've used for years. And in a way it was true because the only entrant seems to have been the United States. Since the uh, Chinese tested their rather primitive anti-satellite weapon a year ago, I don't think we can make that argument because the Chinese have shown us that they may be interested in challenging us. Another argument uh, commonly made by the United States is that you can't really define what is a space weapon because any satellite can be used to damage or destroy another satellite. I don't know many people who accept that argument. Uh, one of the leading, America's leading scientists and Dick Garman uh, thinks it's pretty fallacious. If, if, you want to, if you want to destroy or damage another satellite, you'd better use a weapon designed from the ground up. Because it's very hard once you're in orbit to change orbit. It's very, very hard. You can't take a weather satellite and make that into a weapon. You just can't do it. So that's kind of a fallacious argument. But the third reason is, and then Don Rumsfeld's Space Commission in uh, 2001 said this very clearly, we want to keep our options open. We don't want a new treaty that might tie our hands. We want to keep our options open. And actually, some people I respect uh, a lot say the same thing. Michael O'Hanlon at Brookings makes the same argument. He, he doesn't he doesn't like the kind of rhetoric we use. We, he, he thinks it's, it's unwise to, to push space dominance as, a, as aggressively as we have. But he doesn't think a treaty is a good idea because some, someday we may, we may want uh, anti-satellite weapons. But still, I'm bothered by the fact that we simply will not talk seriously. We say it's impossible to draft a treaty. I think it would be hugely, hugely difficult. But we don't know how difficult it would be until we really sit down and, and began serious talks about it. And I, I think, and here I'm speaking from an idealistic standpoint, I suppose. I think the great powers probably have learned something from the last century. They have learned that, uh, that arms races often lead to war, not always, but often lead to war. They lead to huge expenditures. The Soviet Union pretty much went bankrupt over military expenditures. But most importantly, they, uh, they have huge opportunity costs. 
the world is facing uh, some tremendous problems that don't respect national boundaries. And I don't want to do a laundry list of problems, but they range from global warming down to rampant pathogens, new and new pathogens of a dangerous sort. We need to have a spirit of cooperation in this century among nations, or we're going to blow it. I can't imagine how a world that has nearly six and a half billion people is going to, to make it if we have another arms race. It's just going to poison the intellectual atmosphere if we do that. So I think we need to really sit down and see if something can be crafted. Again, I don't think it would be easy. I think uh, very tough people on our side would have to be the negotiators. It shouldn't be people like me because I tend to take a, a rosy view of things. It should be people like John Mearsheimer, <laughs> a friend of mine who, uh, who takes a very tough view toward treaties. But we ought to sit down and work at it for a few years. We are so far ahead in space technology that we could afford to spend two or three years trying to find out whether the Russians and the Chinese are serious about this. The Chinese have been pushing a space treaty for many years now, and the Russians have too. In fact, they're working together, which is not a good way to, <laughs> to uh, impress the American people. The Chinese and Russians are working on it. But I, I think we ought to sit down and see if we can make some progress. And also, I think we need to remember what our founding values are. I, the American experiment, which I, is still ongoing, is a pretty noble thing. Individual sovereignty is a noble thing, and the idea of the supremacy of the rule of law is pretty noble. We think of ourselves, in our Fourth of July rhetoric, as a law-abiding nation. The rule of law is paramount. But on the in, in international affairs, we see things a little differently. As I mentioned a moment ago, virtually all the nations of the world are on record as favoring the negotiation of a new treaty that would prevent an arms race in space. We're the only major nation that says no to that. In some sense, that makes us a lawless nation, it seems to me. We simply say, we, can't, we don't want to do it, it's impossible, so the heck with it. I don't think that's consistent with the American spirit. And also, I'm not the only one who thinks that. In 2002 and 2003, I was on three national commissions looking into space issues, military space issues. These are closed-door meetings, and uh, they were think tankers, academics, and military people, especially Air Force people. And I was struck by the fact that so many of the people in the Air Force believed that America was going too far in pushing for the idea of space dominance. And one in particular, believed it was just not consistent with America's founding values. He believed that America should lead by example, and part of the, one of the examples is respect for the rule of law, and we should see, and I, I'm quoting him indirectly, we should see if we can't negotiate a real treaty. He thinks it would be it would be a grand thing. It would be true to the American spirit. I agree with that. At any rate, I said in the beginning I, I really like questions, so I'm going to now ask for questions. Thank you. Great. Th thanks very much, Mike, for a, you know, sort of a a sweeping context that led right into a, a focused conversation about, about space and how this sort of fits together in the, in the world. I think there are going to be lots of questions, and there's an eager one just over here. Please, yeah.
I imagine, have also um, threatened to reciprocate if the United States decides to start a space weapons program. Um, and so I guess my question was, do you know uh, which countries have made these statements, these sort of threats to reciplicate this um, and uh, starting on to it? Well, that, that's a good question, and uh, the the answer is yes. Now, now we are not actively making space weapons yet. Our national policy is not yet space dominance or space control. We're drifting in that direction, but I think there's time to turn that around. Our we began promoting we meaning uh, U.S. Space Command and Air Force Space Command mainly, began promoting the idea of full-spectrum dominance in space in 1996, 1997. And other countries, principally China and Russia, reacted to that in a verbal way through dip diplomatic channels, but it didn't seem to be very... Uh, very serious back then. It became a more serious issue with other countries, really, when uh, Don Rumsfeld became Secretary of Defense, because he was well known to be a space warrior. I used to live in Chicago, and he used to live in Chicago, and we didn't travel in the same social circles, but I would run into him from time to time at the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations. And as early as 1998, I understood pretty clearly that he wanted to uh, uh, get the military much more involved in space than it had been. And when he was uh, named chairman of the Space Commission, congressionally mandated commission, in 2000, and uh, his report came out, uh, which seemed to say pretty clearly that we ought to get more involved in military space and we should give the president the option of weapons in space. And then a few days later became Secretary of Defense, uh, I really began to worry. That's when I began to, to get serious about this book. But regarding other countries, uh, China did do their anti-satellite space in January of last year, and there are three common theories about that. One is as, uh, that the Chinese have been working on anti-satellite weapons for many years, probably since the 1980s, and we probably, that's probably true, because we, uh, uh, during the Star Wars era, we were, uh, although we talked about missile defense, uh, much, much of missile defense uh, also was useful for anti-satellite work. So the PLA has certainly been working on anti-satellite weapons since probably the 1980s. And they tested their missile in January of last year. And one theory is that the PLA simply didn't commute with a, or didn't, uh, didn't talk to the foreign ministry. <laughs> they just did it when they were ready. And, uh, and the foreign ministry has been promoting a space treaty but the PLA does this ham-fisted test. So I've been to China, and I, I know of quite a few Chinese, and I sort of believe that could be true. It's a, although they're pretty efficient at making consumer goods for Walmart, they're, the government itself is corrupt, repressive, uh, certainly not efficient, so I, I believe that could be true. Another theory, uh, promoted chiefly by space warriors, is that the Chinese have been talking about a space treaty to buy time while they work on their technology. And that could be true, too. I, some people I respect very, very greatly hold that opinion. And the third common uh, theory, which I happen to accept, perhaps because it because I, I agree with it, because it, it corresponds with my book, uh, is, is, is that uh, the Chinese have been dismissed by the Americans for so many years when they have talked about uh, negotiating a space treaty that it was kind of a shot across the bow. It said, if we don't sit down and talk pretty soon, we are really going to challenge you. I, I think that's, that's possible. 
but, but who knows? But I do know that since the Chinese test, the Indians have been talking more assertively about military space. Of course, after all, the, the uh, India and China are, have long been in a kind of a Cold War. And uh, if India tests, then Pakistan is going to <laughs> follow suit a year or two later. And Israel could do it at any time. The Israeli capabilities are really quite impressive. So all of a sudden, we could, we could have a real anti satellite race. We could have a number of tests over the next few years. And one of the, uh, one of the really bad things about kinetic kill weapons is that if you smash enough satellites in low Earth orbits, and, and I don't know what the figure would be. I, I've been trying to talk to physicists about this, but, but every time you smash a satellite, you create a lot more debris in orbit, low Earth orbits. And, and the debris breeds more debris, because when a chunk of a smashed satellite hits another chunk of a smashed satellite, they create more debris. And I don't know how much debris you would need to make low Earth orbits very difficult to use or even impossible to use. Um, uh, you know, some people say, well, if you smash 20 satellites, you've pretty well wiped out low Earth orbit as a useful place. And that's a worrisome thing. Right now, most satellites, or for that matter, uh, probes to other planets, go into low Earth orbit, and they call it a parking orbit, before they're sent on to their higher orbits, or to Mars, or Jupiter, or beyond. I think the United States has the capability of launching space probes and, and satellites directly into the higher orbits. It's more expensive, more difficult, and so on, but I think we could do it. But I'm not sure all countries could. If, 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 you, uh, if you wipe out low Earth orbit, or that region of space, do you risk losing the space, the use of space, almost altogether? And if you do, do you have a possible global economic collapse? After all, the international banking system and communications and so on are becoming, or are, very space dependent. Uh, we cannot afford to lose the use of space. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to present a doomsday scenario here, but, but it seems to me a possibility. When people, I, and I, I've heard this, when people talk about an arms race in space, they say, well, so what? It's not like the nuclear arms race. After all, by the end of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union had something like 80,000 weapons, more than 80,000 weapons ready to use at any moment, uh, bombs and warheads, 80,000. Most of those were more powerful than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. So it's clear that if things had really turned seriously bad, we could have ended civilization. But they say when it comes to a conflict in space, so what? You're hitting machines, so what? Well, nobody gets killed. And I, I, I can kind of buy that argument. It's not like dropping a nuclear weapon on Chicago. But, but still, if you hit enough satellites in low Earth orbits, do you precipitate an economic, worldwide economic collapse? I don't know the answer to that. I think he wants another doomsday clock. We have a few more uh, questions. I saw a bunch of hands. Uh, you were next. Yeah, I was just curious. What what is what does a real space war look like if if we were to move to an era of space dominance where two superpowers or two national powers could could actually have conflict in space? What would that look like? Well, it doesn't look like uh, the Star Wars movies. <laughs> I mean, that, that's all fantasy. I mean, it's, it's very hard to maneuver uh, anything in space. And then you're never going to, unless the laws of physics are revised, we're never going to have anything like Star Wars. And I, I, I don't think uh, a conflict in space would look like much, except if, if you have an, enough uh, satellites smashed and debris starts coming down, you're going to have some fireworks. You're going to have, it's going to be like little meteor showers. But, but even that is improbable because most most debris stays in orbit. Uh, the farther you are from the Earth, the more likely the debris is to stay in orbit. Uh, 
So I, I don't think it would look like much, but I think the repercussions would be potentially pretty severe. And again, the opportunity cost. I, I focus on the opportunity cost. If, if we have a, an arms race, uh, we're, we're giving up the, the chance to cooperate on a number of glo global problems. Many, many questions I have, and I'm going to focus on one particular angle of the interpretation. And I don't know if I heard you correctly, but it seems as if you were portraying the United States when it came to space as a lawless nation. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. And I, I want to ask you about that because the president, who was honored um, in this building, was responsible for signing a treaty on outer space. I don't know if you spoke about this before. Yeah. There, there is a treaty. Yeah. And it actually is, doesn't ban everything, but it is one, a treaty that we helped push, negotiated with the Soviets and Great Britain, bans weapons of mass destruction in space, bans the use of the moon and other celestial bodies as um, places to use weapons. And so, my first question would be, how in your interpretation of American exclusivism of us as a lawless nation, where the Outer Space Treaty sort of fits into that? Second question would be, if I understood your talk correctly, so first we have this treaty, assuming that we hadn't violated it and we're not planning on putting nuclear weapons in space. Uh, it, it seems to me, if I understood, you said that most of the weapons that are actually placed in space itself are not feasible. And we're not, that a lot of what is being done thus far is rhetorical, not actual policy. So there was a lot of your talk that was quite apocalyptic, but when you sort of boil it down, as far as I know, you're not saying we're violating the Outer Space Treaty. We don't have any plans yeah. to, so we don't have to worry about weapons mass destruction in space. Uh, we're these are pursuing rhetorical policies, not actually planning on actually deploying any of this. Even if we did these weapons, apparently, according to you, wouldn't work. So what am I supposed to be worried about? Okay, it's a good question. Uh, I, I did talk about the Outer Space Treaty, which actually the, the philosophical ideas were, were enunciated by Eisenhower. And uh, Johnson really attacked Eisenhower in the early days, but then came around. But, but the Outer Space Treaty bans, as you, you said, uh, nuclear weapons in space and other weapons of mass destruction. does not ban any other kind of weapon. The, uh, during uh, the 70s and 80s, people I call space warriors were promoting all kinds of ideas about space-based weapons. Lasers in space and beam weapons in space and, and, and tungsten rods, they be, could be called down and so on and so forth. And uh, I don't think many space warriors are, are very keen anymore on actually basing weapons in space. I, I use the term space-related weapons more than, you know, than space weapons. Uh, if you want to control space, and this is, this is a very theoretical, if you want to control space, they, uh, that means essentially having a reliable anti-satellite capability because uh, you control space by, by denying space to others. And if you ever got into a conflict, you could use ground-based, air-based, and sea-based weapons to do something to the satellites of other nations. And that's the, it's, it's, it's the anti-satellite threat that has really got everybody up in arms right now, everybody meaning the Chinese and, and, the, and the Russians and, and the Indians and so on. It's not actually space-based weapons, but, uh, but ASAT weapons, make no mistake about it, are, are pretty, uh, are pretty uh, ominous things. Now, we also, we meaning uh, anti-ballistic missile uh, people, promoters, are still talking about uh, anti-ballistic -miss anti missile weapons in space, space-based anti-ballistic missile weapons that could attack missiles in their boost phase as they're being fired upwards. 
And that is still kind of a viable idea, depending on how, depending on who you talk to, the, the ABM, space-based ABM system is still being talked about a lot. And of course, if you have that kind of a system based in space, then you have an ideal anti-satellite system too. So, what we need to worry about are anti-satellite weapons. I don't think for a moment we have to worry about lasers in space, even though U.S. Space Command put out a brochure in 1997 that shows a, a laser in space zapping a target down near the ground. We don't have to worry about that anymore. But ASAT weapons, we do. And other, we have to worry about it. Other countries are worried about it. Uh, the Chinese, so far as I can tell, and I'm talking off the record with a number of Chinese, do not think for a moment that the United States is going to attack China. But they do believe that between our, our national missile defense system, which looks to them like an anti-Chinese system, uh, uh, between that and an ASAT system, that we will have a, a tremendous coercive power on China in the future. And no great power wants to be coerced, doesn't want to be at the mercy of another power. But when you look at our, our Trident D-5 missiles, which are extraordinarily accurate, uh, they look like a first strike weapon to the Chinese. And an anti-satellite system looks like, or the anti-missile, this is anti-ballistic missile system looks like part of a first strike system. And an ASAT system looks like a part of that package too. I would like to ask you a little bit about the, uh, more about this proposed agreement that you seem to be advocating, that we should, uh, we should have some sort of a space treaty, um, space weapons treaty. I'm wondering about the verifiable issue, uh, whether, whether any kind of treaty like that could be enforced, and ultimately, is it really in the interest of the United States? in the national security interest of the United States. In the Cold War, if I remember correctly, there were these space arms control efforts that really faltered when uh, the parties couldn't reach an agreement, as I think you might have uh, said a word or two about uh, what really constitutes a, a space weapon. I mean, these are very real issues to the, to the parties that are involved. And also, the case in point is, for instance, the PRC's uh, uh, event uh, in January of 2007 that you mentioned on, on several occasions. Uh, if I remember correctly, they used uh, a standard uh, ballistic, uh, ballistic missile and uh, stopped uh, with a more or less sophisticated warhead. And, uh, and uh, a treaty that would be capable of eliminating the missile seems to be quite improbable as is, as is verifying the destruction, for instance, of a warhead, uh, or the capacity to reproduce that warhead uh, in, in the future. And the other thing that is, you know, it's a floor, like my book is about science, but also just basic uh, sort of logic background is that the Russians and the, and the Chinese effort to, to advance this new treaty uh, is, is not at all surprising. I mean, <laughs> They have nothing to lose and everything to gain, and basically they could provide cover for their own self-serving uh, attempts to constrain the U.S. while doing and continuing their own clandestine uh, anti-satellite programs, which you admit that you know they have had for a long time. Well, they have been working on it for a long yeah, time. Yeah, for a long, long time. So having said all this, uh, I'm just wondering that you, you yourself said, and I wrote it down, that they are, quote, hugely, hugely difficult. Yeah. Uh, project. Is this really in the U.S. national security interest? Well, I, I tend to agree with about 85 percent of what you've just said. It, it would be hugely difficult, and the verification issue is, of course, the toughest nut, or just about the toughest nut. The Chinese and Russians, for instance, who have been actively promoting a new space treaty since 1999, have said they're pretty leery about verification. I, I think that's a pretty basic issue. I, I would not want a space treaty that didn't have really good verification measures. I think that's going to be very difficult. 
Now, you, you talk about you know, the experience of the Soviet Union, the United States, but, but that's a different context. The Soviet Union and the United States were in an atmosphere of mutual dis mistrust all the time. I mean, they, they had, they had, we, we had thousands, we had thousands of warheads on each side pointed at the other. I mean, that was a, that was a very nasty situation. I don't think it's the same with China because I, I think China has, has indicated as much as they possibly can that they don't want to, they don't want to take us on militarily. I mean, why, why would they, uh, if they learned anything from the, from the, fall of the Soviet Union, they, they learn that the United States tends to win uh, technology-heavy arms races. Uh, as, as, I, as I say repeatedly, they, they want to make products for the West. They want to integrate to some great degree uh, in the economic and financial sphere. They, they don't want an arms race. Why, why would they? So if we really took them seriously. We might make some progress, we might not. We might f discover that the Chinese and the Russians have just been posturing. We might find out that they want to limit our ability to conduct precision war. After all, they can argue, and, and others have argued, that GPS satellites and observation satellites and so, so on are are really space weapons in that they're part of a weapons system. That's not a bad argument. Uh, you cannot hit targets precisely unless you can identify where they are, and space assets play a large role in that. And uh, GPS plays a large role in actually getting the missile on target. So if, if their idea is they can limit our capabilities, that's not going to fly either. My overall point is we don't know until we sit down and talk seriously what we can do, what kind of, what kind of uh, progress, if any, we can make. It doesn't do us much good, I think, to say we're not going to sit down and talk. As far as uh, our national security interests are concerned, so we lose two or three years. We are so far ahead that we could afford to lose two or three years, and if, if, it, if the talks fail, if we decide after two or three years, they're not serious. Uh, we won't have lost any real ground and we will have learned something pretty important. I think we have time for one or two more. The student, please. Uh, aside from evident um, weapons programs, do you think that the U.S. Uh, peaceful space exploration program, uh, NASA, and specifically Constellation, the Constellation program right now, do you think that has a role in leading to do you think it might be inevitable that building arms race if we continue with on our plans that exclude other nations in uh, going to the moon and going to Mars? Well, <laughs> I, uh, for one thing, I'd like to see us uh, uh, invite the Chinese to be part of the International Space Station. Uh, that would be a nice little gesture. I I can't probably answer that 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 question. I. Uh, Honest to God, I, I think the atmosphere has been so poisoned with our rhetoric, not necessarily even with our, with our actual technology, but our rhetoric about space dominance. The rhetoric is just uh, awfully offensive. And, and, and I've always believed, as I hope you all do, that ideas have consequences. And our rhetoric has consequences. It's got a lot of people pretty, pretty upset. Uh, Canada, our partner in NORAD, has long been uh, at odds with us over our rhetoric over space control and space dominance. Please. A little bit of commentary first, if I may. You have Briefly. mentioned that China is interested in trade, and therefore why would China possibly want to get involved in competition level the war with the United States? And what you're saying reminded me of Norman, Norman Angel's work, The Great Illusion, which in 1910 was published, where he used arguments showing that Germany and Britain were so interlocked economically that war between the two was impossible. This was at a time when Germany had embarked upon a naval race against Britain, which at that time was the premier naval power. Now, the lesson here is that economic interaction does not prevent an arms race. Secondly, 
it made no sense in a certain way for Germany to engage in a naval race, except to compete with Britain. So even things that don't make sense sometimes happen. And the naval issue brings me to an analogy. The oceans are regarded as the commons. Everyone may use them, but everyone protects their use of them. And we would like to be able to protect not just our coastal waters, but we would like to be able to control the oceans to prevent an enemy using the oceans coming to attack us. Similarly, we would like to be able to control the air to prevent an attack. And the analogy applies to space. Space is another commons. Everyone may use it. But we ought to be able to protect our national interest if that demands controlling space. That does not necessarily mean others cannot use it, just that they cannot use it to our detriment. Now, you talk about anti-satellites. We are the country that is more dependent than any other on satellites. And you're familiar, I'm sure, with the Air Force pilots' adage of aviate, navigate, and communicate. Hmm. These are all issues that are dependent upon satellite communications. And even the ground forces move, shoot, and communicate are dependent upon satellite information technologies and so forth. So we are very vulnerable to anti-satellite systems. Therefore, it would make sense for us to be able to protect against them, not just passively by protecting our satellites, but actively by being able to interdict anti-satellite weapons. So there is a national interest for us to do that. But you tell us that the opportunity costs would be great. And my question is this. What is the opportunity cost if we do not do this? Well, yeah, that's a line of reasoning which, which has a lot of plausibility to it. And I, I'm well aware of the naval arms race back in the early part of the last century. And my, my response to that is, is twofold. One, I think the great powers have learned something. I hope they've learned something from, from the last century. And number two, nuclear weapons have really changed that equation significantly. And we'd have to talk about that at, at some more length. The other thing is, yes, our satellites need to be protected. But space-related weapons are not the way to do it. It is, for instance, uh, some space warriors talk about bodyguard satellites. Let's put uh, uh, satellites in orbit with our most expensive spy sats, our multi-billion dollar spy sats, bodyguard satellites that could intercept weapons coming their way, thus protecting the satellite. But when you begin to look at the physics of that, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, the bodyguard satellite would have to respond pretty much instantaneously to, uh, to the launch of a, of a missile toward it. And, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of physicists have looked at this problem and, and, and have, have concluded that it just would not work. Meanwhile, the bodyguard satellite would be perceived, again, in China and Russia and elsewhere, as an offensive weapon. We, we like the word defense, 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 but, but uh, everything we talk about uh, is really a, potentially, a potential offensive weapon. You, uh, if you put something in space to guard your own satellites, you, uh, you put something in space that can smash the satellite of another nation. So it, it, it gets to, into complicated territory. They, uh, I, I, I can't tell you how many, how many people I've talked to, even who believe that we should do X, Y, and Z, who admit that we can't protect our own assets in space this way if another nation decides to have a conflict with us. What we can do, they believe, is we can, we can be seen as so powerfully coercive that nobody will take us on. Now, Don Rumsfeld's Space Commission report talked about a space Pearl Harbor. And uh, by that, they meant that some nation would uh, secretly develop an, an anti-satellite capability so, so vast that we could be taken unaware. And they could hit 20 or 30 of our satellites virtually simultaneously. 
Not even we have that capability. And as a lot of scientists point out, you can't develop that capability without extensive testing. You, uh, the Chinese have demonstrated that they could possibly ta take out a satellite, but not even necessarily. The test that worked was the third try. Now, we don't know if the first two tries were actually shooting at a point in, in space that wasn't occupied by, by anything. But the majority opinion seems to be that they simply missed the first two times and then they hit their satellite the, the third time. If you're, going to, if you're going to risk a war with the United States with a space Pearl Harbor, you'd, be, you'd, you'd better be pretty darn sure that you can actually hit all those satellites at the same time. And then you'd, be, you'd, you'd better be pretty darn sure that the United States is not going to send uh, nuclear armed missiles over to hit you. Uh, the scenario just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, there is no way, truly, to protect assets in space if somebody wants to hit them. Uh, the, the, short of having a treaty that would, at a minimum, ban the testing of missiles in an anti-satellite mode. But even that's not going to fly because we've done that, the Russians have done it, and the Chinese have done it, perhaps, so other countries aren't going to go with that. Now, there are many proposals floating around, and one would be, let's not even try for an international treaty, the kind of thing that the Outer Space Treaty represents, but let's at least have bilateral negotiations with the Chinese, or trilateral negotiations with the Chinese and the Russians. And, and see if we can work something out. And maybe that would evolve into a broader treaty. Uh, one concept on the table are rules of the road. Uh, the rules of the road don't appeal to me very much because they, they can be easily violated. But, uh, you know, that's possible too. I, well, I, I could go on and talk. but. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you very much for a very informative session. I think we had great questions. We are uh, at the end of our session, but I think this was uh, um, a wonderful session in many ways, both because of the discussion about space and the broader context of international relations, but because um, we got to talk about LBJ in the LBJ Presidential Library, and that doesn't always come up, and I'd like to take that opportunity to thank our co-host, Betty Sue Flowers, the director of the LBJ Library, and um, thank, you. thank you all for coming and uh, uh, take this opportunity once again to thank Mike Moore for coming to our talk. And I would like to say one more thing, uh, okay. if you don't mind. I've, oh. used, I've used the term space warrior quite often, and I don't want anybody to regard that as a pejorative use. <laughs> and, and it occurs to me that maybe some of you think that. Yeah, right. One, one of the leading space warriors, in fact, possibly the leading space warriors in, endorsed my book. Uh, we're, we're good friends. We don't agree on anything re regarding space, but he thinks I've treated them fairly and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. I, all the space warriors I've met, and I've met quite a few of them by now, have been decent, honorable, forthright people. They have a different worldview than mine, and we understand that. But, but please don't interpret that as being a knock on them because it really isn't. Every every space warrior I've met, I like a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Al Alan uh, also reminded me to pitch. Thank you for the clarification, Mike. But uh, once again, Tim Naftali on April second. We hope to see you for our next talk. He's uh, talking about the foreign policy of George H. W. Bush. And uh, once again, thank you for coming. And please don't misinterpret Mike. Let's thank him. <laughs>